perhaps I'll start with um, a couple of stories um, about personal experiences with education in Ghana. And I would like to start with um, my own experience when I first went to primary school. So after kindergarten, uh, my family moved to Accra and uh, I ended up in a school that I didn't like very much. Uh, one of the pedagogical tools in this school was caning. So if you got the answer wrong, you were caned. And I got caned a lot. I failed almost every class. And my parents eventually took me out of that school when I showed up at home one day with my left hand swollen from, from a caning. And I still remember, I still remember that incident. You know, I was five years old and I still remember my swollen hand and I remember my father going to the school and yelling. Um, they moved me out of that school. Um, and in the next school that I went to, I went from being bottom of the class to top of the class in just one term. It's just completely different environment, a happier place um, where kids were more nurtured than where I had been before. Another story is a story about my gardener's son. You know, we had, my wife and I had really encouraged him to make sure his, his kid went to school and he sent his kid to school, but we found out after three years of schooling that he was illiterate. He had memorized books and it appeared that he was reading, but he could not read the word I-S. He could not read the word no, N-O, after three years. So we took him out of that school and put him in a private school at our expense. And three weeks later, he had started to read. Three years, three weeks, completely different results. And it really is, and, and the question is, what explains this? And, and by the way, how pervasive is this problem? So in 2013, Ghana's National Education Assessment, which is a, an assessment, uh, they, they tested 35,000 kids after three years and six years of basic education, 170 districts across the country, a representative sample. 50% of these children, after three years or six years of education, could not read in any language, not a word. 40% could read, but with no comprehension. So really, after three years, six years of education, 90% functionally illiterate. So this is not just a story about me and my gardener's son. It is a story about an entire generation, entire generations going through this problem. 2% could read fluently with comprehension. So this is our 2013 assessment. It's something that's done every couple of years. The good news is, is Ghana is measuring and starting to pay attention um, and is open and transparent about it so we can fix the problem. But the bad news is that we have a significant problem. And this is at the foundational level of education. This year, 70% of kids who completed high school got grades on the national exam that disqualify them from going on to any kind of tertiary education. They can't go to polytechnic, they cannot go to a college or a university. 70% of our entire high school cohort uh, are not qualified for further education. In countries like Liberia, uh, the situation is worse. I mean, uh, last year, no one qualified for university in Liberia out of the high school system. This, this is a, a dire situation, okay? And we need to deal with this, actually, before we even talk about technical education, 
higher education and so on. And this is the, the quality question that we all talked about so much this morning. In Ghana, there's a movement to upgrade polytechnics to technical universities. And this is in part because of the, the branding issue you were talking about this morning, that kids who go to polytechnics feel looked down upon. The faculty who teach there feel looked down upon, and they want to be full universities. And so the government of Ghana is working to, to convert them to, to technical universities. So still, and the reason we've, they've put the word technical in front of them is to make sure they still have that focus on technical, um, but they're going to be full four-year four programs. In our universities, most of them are narrowly focused. So they're not, we're not mostly implementing a liberal education. And I'm not talking about just the content, but the process and the method of teaching. It's very narrow. It puts people in tunnels. And they don't have that breadth of skills. They don't have that toolkit that enables them to navigate as the world changes. If you educate someone too narrowly, then if, some, if there's a hiccup in the economy, if the thing they'd studied turns out not to be what the economy needs, then they're stuck. Um, and so this is also a situation that's going on. So now I'm going to shift gears a little because I figured what you'd want me to talk about is how do we achieve success? How do we turn things around? Um, but I don't, want to, I don't want to put up a menu list of interventions. I thought what I'd do this afternoon is just focus on a few high-level things that we need to pay attention to. So we need to pay, pay attention to three things. The purpose of education, the mission of education, and the means by which we educate our kids. So the why, the what, and the how. So when I talk about the means, I'm talking about the, cult the culture of education. So um, my experience in primary school where there was a culture of um, inflicting violence on kids because they didn't remember their times table is not the right culture, for example. There needs to be a different culture of educating kids and helping kids learn. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by the why, the what, and the how? I thought what I would do is to use a chassis as a case study because this is how we operate. We believe that these three questions are the most important things about our institution. And they really go to the question of leadership, right? So the why for a chassis is a new Africa. We always remind ourselves that we're here because the world needs a new Africa. And we believe that ethical leadership and innovation and great teams is really what's going to create that new Africa. And this should guide what we do. The what is about our mission. So we edu we're educating a new generation of ethical entrepreneurial leaders in Africa. And we're cultivating critical thinking, concern for others, and courage. Most people, when they talk, think about innovation, think about ideation, creativity. But actually, innovation requires more courage. It takes courage to have that new idea. It takes courage to act on that new idea. It takes courage to persist when there are difficulties as you execute. And so innovation really, first and foremost, is about helping kids to, to have courage, to overcome their fears. And we never forget that part of our mission. The what? is also about a set of learning goals that the faculty and the executive team at Ashesi sat down and put together. What are the attributes that we would want every graduate from our institution to have? And if you look at this list, you will notice that it doesn't have anything to do with any disciplinary area. These are general. Ethics and civic engagement, critical and quantitative reasoning, communication skills, leadership and teamwork, innovation and action, curiosity, skill has to do with the disciplinary area, but curiosity before that. 
um, and technological competence, the ability to use the technology of their time, whatever that time may be. So that technology will be different 50 years from now. But these are our learning goals. And it's not just an empty list. Every professor, when they come up with their course syllabus, they not only describe the objectives of the course and how they're going to grade and the topics they'll cover, but they also describe which of these learning goals that their course is going to address. And we encourage them to, to address three or four of them on average. So if after four years of every professor intentionally thinking about these learning goals and how they apply in his or her course, and students getting through that, after four years, magic happens. So the what for us is about our mission, it's about a set of objectives that our education will, will achieve. And finally, how. Now, how we do it, as I said before, has to do with institutional culture. And culture is, what are the set of things that guide our decisions and our actions on a daily basis? Every day, what are the, what are the principles that guide us? We try to design them into our logo. So our logo has an Ashanti stool at the bottom, and it has three pillars between the, the base and the seat for scholarship, leadership, and citizenship. It has a person under a roof. It has an eye for exploration and discovery. So even at the level of designing our logo, we try to think about this. But they're not just words. We defined what scholarship means to us. Scholarship really, at its heart, is about learning. It's about being students all the time. It's about sharing what we know with others and learning from others. It's about broadening the conversation and, and embracing new ideas. Leadership is about being force multipliers in the teams we work in. How do we help others to be successful? How do we leverage the talents and the skills of others? How do we share our own talents with others? And how do we always go beyond the call of duty? That is leadership. And finally, citizenship is about community and society. Answering the question, what I'm about to do, does it meet the 50-year test? Do a, thought ex do a thought exercise. 50 years forward, will I still think this is a good decision? Now, this set of things we've built into our management structure. So the performance reviews for the staff, for the faculty, have this built into it. And when you do that, you build a community with a purpose, you have close interaction, you have students stepping out and engaging with their community, you have students that, that enact the first honor system in Africa, um, and you have graduates who touch millions of lives. It all starts with these three questions. Um, why are we here, what do we do, and how do we do what we do? So I would say that we need, we need to step back and we need to really define clearly what the purpose is for basic, secondary, technical, and higher education. I think that over the last decade, the purpose has been enrollment meeting the Millennium Challenge, uh, Millennium Development Goals. Let's get everybody, everybody in school. But that purpose is not enough. We need a deeper purpose of why we educate kids. And then we need to figure out at the basic education level, the secondary school level, the technical level, and the higher education level, what exactly we do and what kind of institutional cultures we want to build. It's about stepping back and looking at this from a leadership perspective first. And if we do that, then I believe we will see a dramatic change in our educational systems. I want to end by just saying that, you know, I think that Ghana has, we have our hearts in the right place. The government, the last three decades, has spent on average 20% of government spending goes to education. It peaked at 33% in 2011. We're putting a lot of money behind this. People care. It's not that we don't care. We really care. But I think we've just missed 
getting, you know, thinking through the high level things and then really selling that to everybody, making sure everything is aligned. If we do that in Ghana and in other African countries, I think we'll be able to make profound change on the continent because the money we're committing already. We just need this other stuff. Thank you very much.